Our top three most bizarre transport methods begins with the so-called fish cannon. Fish that come shooting out of a pipe and guys who apparently feed these fish into some kind of cannon. What's going on here? Is it a circus act or is there more to it? We find the company behind the videos in Seattle on the west coast of the USA. There we've arranged to meet the boss, Todd Deligan. So this is Woosh Innovations. We have created a new system for the transport of delicate objects over distance. And what we're seeing on the video is uh, fish moving over distance here. If we look around our shop, we can see our system, our tubes up in the air. But why do you have to transport fish through the air at all? It all starts with these patented plastic tubes. Later, the fish are supposed to slip through them. That's why they have to be particularly flexible and resistant. We spent about two and a half to three years and several million dollars uh, developing just this sleeve or conduit. So it took uh, a long period of time. And what generally looks simple is usually very hard. The factory floor is also the company's testing ground. Todd and his engineer get the $200,000 fish cannon ready to go. A misting device makes sure the pipe is kept slippery, just like a water slide. At the push of a button, the pump starts up, supplying the system with the necessary air pressure. There's a specially adapted pipe for every type of fish. Today, it's freshly caught salmon. And now we're going to run fish. What you're going to see is the fish accelerating through the pump house. It's going to go up and around the conduit, and it's going to come right back through over here. Now, in a processing plant, it would be going from point A to point B. Here, we're just practicing. We're just testing. The fish shoots off at lightning speed, accelerating up to 35 kilometers per hour. They travel 45 meters through two halls, and after barely four seconds, they're back again. And out we come. And we have a good-looking fish at the end. The fish transport actually seems to work. But what happens inside the fish cannon? Connected to the beginning of the pipe, there's a kind of vacuum cleaner. It draws air out of the tube and sucks in the fish, which is then trapped in a chamber between two flaps. Compressed air now builds up here. The flap opens and the fish is catapulted through the pipe from behind. OK, so transporting dead fish works. But the internet video also showed live fish, didn't it? We can adapt the same system to live fish. And what we'll see is that no damage to live fish at all. We want to keep those live fish happy and healthy. This is indeed what we want to see. Todd sends us 500 kilometers further south to the Washougal River in Washington state. Here, the local fishing authority has bought the first outdoor fish cannon for $150,000. The biologists want to pull hundreds of salmon from the river and bring them to a breeding point. There, they want to fertilize the salmon and then return them to the river. The aim is to get lots more salmon into the river than there were before. Until now, however, transporting the fish between the river and the breeding pond has been a huge problem because salmon are very sensitive and very jumpy. Before we were just, you know, trucking them up. Woo. But having the whoosh really helps because just the sheer number, you know? Like we don't have to physically walk them up there, it just transports them. Because now they go directly to the water truck by fish cannon. The biologists first examine the fish in the water. If they find a marked farmed salmon, it goes into the cannon. But that's not always so easy. But if they do manage it, the fish shoots up the slope 60 meters in three seconds into the water tank on the truck. With the cannon, Willie and his colleagues take up to 500 salmon out of the river every day. But does the high speed and the landing really do the fish no harm? 
when you see into the tank, they just they seem relaxed. And, um, and when they go back up to the hatchery for brood, they don't, you know, these tulies are not very, they die easily. And uh, they're doing just fine. The fish in the truck actually do seem normal. The fish transport doesn't seem to have harmed them. And several studies by the fisheries department have confirmed this. Half an hour later, the first truck of the day leaves. In the past, it would have taken up to four hours. Dozens of salmon would not have survived the stress. On the river, the system is a complete success. Soon the company plans to install a 500 meter long fish cannon above a dam. Our next bizarre transport method can be found in every major hospital, the pneumatic tube. Old fashioned at first glance, but in reality an extremely sophisticated system. Here at Berlin's Charité Hospital, X-rays and medical records are sent from ward to ward at least 3,000 times a day. Since 1982, this has been done by pneumatic tube. Ancient, but lightning fast. And pneumatic tubes can do what SMS and email can't. They can also transport material. Even sensitive material like blood samples. The relevant results are returned to the sender very quickly. They are sent in cylindrical carriers. The nickname at Charité is bombs. At a speed of around 40 kilometers per hour, they can travel 12 meters per second. No human being can do that. But how does a cylinder get from A to B in the first place? The pneumatic tube system works like an extensive underground network with 12 different lines. They're distributed over the entire Charité site. On all these lines, the carriers can be dropped off or sent at 140 stations. To make sure the system gets the carrier to the right destination, a code is entered before it's sent. For example, Ward C, 13. No matter which of the many wards and different buildings the carriers come from, each one always ends up in the pneumatic tube system's main office first. This is where the so-called scanner is located. It reads the coding, i.e. C13. The code is then passed on to an electrical relay station. This, in turn, sets the appropriate points in the tube system, similar to a railway, so that the carrier goes into line C and can be discharged at station 13. But how do the carriers get from the basement to the top floor against gravity? The solution is large compressed air pumps. They simply suck the carriers in the tube upwards, as pneumatic tube technician Gert Gulke explains to us. They work like giant vacuum cleaners that create a vacuum in the pipe system. And they have to have such a high pressure because the lines are up to eight, nine hundred meters long. And there, well, up to ten cans can go all at once. Before the carriers arrive at their destination, they have to travel to the very highest point of their line. In the hospital tower, this is the 21st floor. From here, the canisters fall downwards to their destination, this time using gravity. So that they can do so, each carrier first has to pass through this airlock. And pass the so-called sluice flaps, why exactly does the system need these sluice flaps? There's a vacuum in the pneumatic tube lines. This sucks the cans upwards. But they also have to go down. And they can only go down thanks to the sluice flaps. They practically cut the canister off from the upward suction force. It takes a maximum of three minutes for each can to reach its destination on the 190,000 square meter Charité site. It really doesn't get any faster than that. But our most bizarre transport method is the bridge made of grass. Yes, you heard that right. Every year, in the middle of the Peruvian Andes, at an altitude of almost 4,000 meters, the farmers of the region weave a bridge out of grass. The method is over 500 years old and originates from the Incas. Meanwhile, this bridge, which crosses the Apurimac River, is the last grass bridge in the world. It only lasts for one year. Then the grass is rotten and the work starts again. Yeah, 
At the moment, nobody can go on the old bridge. After one year, it's just too dangerous. The sun and rain have made the grass brittle. To build a new one, we first have to go to the fields and harvest the raw material. The raw material is so-called ichu grass. It only grows in the high plains of the South American Andes. The farmers painstakingly harvest half a ton of this raw material by hand. The grass must be completely dry. We beat it so that it doesn't break. Ichu grass is extremely tough, but it breaks very quickly. That's why 50 farmers have to beat every stalk flat for hours. That's the only way to break the tube-like structure inside the stalks and make them pliable. Weaving the small ropes is women's work. In two days, they twist a total of 45 kilometers of grass. They're not allowed to help with building the bridge. That brings bad luck and angers the gods. So now, it's up to the men. They spread out the ropes and then twist and twist and twist. This turns 30 thin ropes into one thick one. While they're still twisting at the front, the farmers are already weaving a thick plait at the back. Together, the farmers carry the 170 kilogram grass rope to the bridge building site. On the other side of the river, helpers are already waiting for the new bridge support ropes. Using thin ropes, they arduously pull the heavy tresses across the old bridge. Now the time has come for the old bridge to go. The farmers cut the rotten ropes with a sickle. The river takes on the job of disposal. Now the fixing of the new bridge begins. The men knock the rope around a stone roller embedded in the ground, an Inca construction that is already over 500 years old. Now comes the most important part of building the bridge, pulling the ropes taut. And this can only be done, in the truest sense of the word, if everyone pulls together. After two hours, the rope tightening work comes to an end. Now the so-called Inca engineers come into play. These two particularly experienced bridge builders tie and knot 300 side ropes, and they do it without any securing at all. After an hour, both engineers meet in the middle of the bridge and finish the job. Finally, the farmers cover the one meter wide grass surface with a wooden walkway. The bridge is finished. It will connect the villages here for one year and carry hundreds of Peruvian farmers. It's the very last of its kind, the only grass bridge in the world.